This is a diesel heater. This particular diesel heater has been in my van for a year now and it has been completely reliable. I haven't done any maintenance and it just works every time I turn it on. So in this video, I'm going to be taking this heater apart, talking about where to buy these heaters, how to install them so that they will work reliably and consistently, common issues that people have with these heaters, and I'm going to be doing a little bit of myth busting because there's a lot of bad information on the internet about these heaters. But before I go any further, if you take anything from this video, get a carbon monoxide detector for your living space. So these units are actually really simple. And all you really need to understand about these is that you have a combustion air intake, a fuel inlet, and an exhaust outlet. And then the hot air comes from this side and the cabin air that is going to be heated is drawn in from this side. Okay, so let's start taking this thing apart. Uh, the cabin air inlet side typically unscrews. Most of these cheap diesel heaters are exact clones of the Eberspacher or Airtronic diesel heaters, which retail for about 10 times the price of one of these. And so you unscrew the air inlet side and then this little cover comes off and this reveals the heat exchanger. And we have a, a blower fan, the inlet fan, and this pulls in cool air and forces it over this heat exchanger. We have the main PCB motherboard here of the heater that communicates with the controller. This is where the glow plug lives. It just lives under this little rubber thing here. And that's how you pull that out. And then there's a thermometer or a temperature probe that monitors the temperature of the body of the heater. So I've actually never taken one of these apart before, but it appears you just need some metric Allen keys. And right now what I'm doing is I'm removing the motherboard or the control board of the unit. And so once we get that unscrewed, we can just unclip all of these connectors. And then we just pull this out and the main board we can set aside. All right, so next step, I should probably look up how to do this before I try to show it on YouTube. But yeah, I'm just gonna tilt that to the side and pull this out. But we can see here, this is the, the main body of the diesel heater. The combustion chamber is in here. So this whole thing might come apart with just a four millimeter Allen key, which would be pretty cool. I'd like to note that these screws are not very tight. And if you do take your heater apart this far, there is a gasket in here. And so you're gonna wanna have a spare gasket on hand if you intend to take this apart. So I just learned that these heater gaskets are likely made with asbestos. That's not good. Um, I actually, because of that, I wouldn't recommend taking this heater apart if you can help it. And then if you do have to take it apart, wear a mask and be super careful. Alrighty. So now we just give this a little wiggle and it comes right apart. And so I think one of the most interesting things about these units is that the blower fan and the fan that pulls in the combustion gases is on the same shaft. So there's only one motor in this thing, and I think a lot of people don't realize that. This is where the combustion intake is, and this fan just pulls it in to the combustion chamber. So the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna take out these four screws, and we're gonna look inside the combustion chamber. But I think first I might have to pull out the glow plug. I have a tool specific for pulling out the glow plug. I would recommend getting one of these. We can see how that works. That just goes right on there. And then we'll take our Allen key and hopefully this isn't so tight that we can't just unscrew it. Okay. And so, yeah, that's our glow plug. All right, so now we have the screws out and this thing just comes right open. So very often when someone takes one of these apart, there will be a ton of soot in the burn chamber and a bunch of soot in the heat exchanger. And as you can see, I, I don't have much at all. This is actually very clean. And a lot of people will say to keep it clean, you need to run the heater on high. And that is a myth. That is the number one myth I wanna bust. Uh, I run my heater on low pretty much exclusively and I have no soot buildup. And it's because I maintain a lean burn mixture. So if anything, there's just a lot of dirt inside of this heater. And uh, a lot of people will put filters on the intake to prevent this, but it's really not necessary. I haven't had any problems with this heater. And yeah, there's, there's dust and dirt in here. There's, I think this is mostly Utah dust, but it hasn't caused any issues. And I think it would be a long time before it did cause any issues. 
So high level, when you turn on your heater, the first thing that happens is the glow plug gets red hot. Then the fuel pump and the blower fan start up at the same time. So this fuel pump sends a little dose of fuel a few times a second, and this blower fan starts blowing. And so the magic happens here in the combustion chamber because we have the, the glow plug plugged into here and the fuel comes in on this thing here and then the blower fan blows right into the inlet. And so this is where the burn starts and after a short amount of time, the glow plug will turn off. So the, the flame is kind of self-sustaining with every pulse of fuel, you get a flare up and this holds enough heat that you don't need to keep the glow plug going, which makes this really electrically efficient. And then the exhaust gases come out of the end of the burner. There's a lot of radiant heat that comes off of this too. And that goes through the heat exchanger. So the heat exchanger has fins on the inside and fins on the outside. And remember that this blower fan is also forcing air over the heat exchanger. So that's how you get a clean, dry heat free of exhaust gases. And then when you turn off your heater, everything ramps down and the glow plug lights up again after fuel is long gone. And that's just to keep the glow plug clean. So this is a brand new diesel heater. Uh, thank you Vever or, or Vivor or Vever for sending this to me. It's such a funny company. They make ice cube trays and industrial mixers and diesel heaters and uh, they sent this to me for free in exchange for a review. And uh, after they sent it to me, they gave me a, a link, an Amazon link that they wanted me to put in the description of my video. And I'm not gonna do that because I don't think anyone should buy this diesel heater. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But regardless, we are going to set this guy up and get it running and talk about how you set these things up. All right, so we got our Viver unboxed here. And the first thing that strikes me is that this gasket doesn't fit very well. You really want this to sit flush so that when you uh, mount it to your mounting plate or whatever you wind up using, that uh, you won't have any exhaust gases leaking in. And I mean, it's possible that if I were to just put nuts on here and crank this down, that this would seal all right. But we want to throw out this gasket anyways. And, l and let me explain why. So this gasket, it stinks. And number one complaint I hear about these heaters is that they smell like hot rubber or hot plastic. And this is a really big contributor. So this, this smells like tire rubber. It should be silicone. Silicone would be really good. And what a lot of people do is they'll use this or the, uh, the mounting plate as a template, and then they'll buy like a, a silicone baking mat, and then you cut that out, and then you have a gasket, but you don't have this smell. But yeah, this is terrible. Um, big thumbs down here. I also found that these are shockingly flammable. So while we're talking about smells, I'm gonna show you another piece of these that likes to stink. I have to say, in general, I found that the quality of these diesel heaters has gone down. So the first one that I installed in my first van had a silicone gasket. It didn't stink, and, and there was a bit of a smell when I first started it up, but it burned off really quickly. But the second heater that I got, the one that I have been running in my van for a year, the smell didn't go away until I removed this and I addressed an, an issue inside the heater. So let's, let's see how the beaver is doing. So inside the case of the heater, there are these four rubber pads, and these keep the body of the heater from vibrating against the housing. And unfortunately, they've started using really cheap, smelly rubber for these pads. And so this is one of those vibration isolating pads. And in my opinion, I don't think this should be as flammable as it is. And uh, oh, it smells, when you take a lighter to it, it smells like the nastiest burnt rubber. So I would not run these, uh, oh. Again, uh, if you buy one of those silicone baking mats, you could just replace it. And that's the really disappointing thing about these heaters is I think like 90% of the components are really good and they work well. And then they just cheap out on the, the little details and it, it makes it a bad product. So let's take a look at some of the other stuff that they sent me. Uh, they sent me this fuel tank. The big problem with these is the caps. Uh, if the cap is set up properly, it'll allow air to vent into the tank. And that's necessary because the fuel pump, when it pumps fuel out of the tank, it will draw a vacuum on the tank. So there has to be a vent 
but I often find that the vent allows gases to flow both ways. And so what you need to do is drill this out and replace the, the vent that's in the middle of the cap with a pit bike breather tube. Then these tanks, if you do that, uh, won't let fumes into your living space. I haven't noticed any smells with these tanks once I did that modification. But I would also recommend not filling up this tank all the way because if fuel is sloshing against the cap all the time, you are gonna get some smells, even with that breather, I think. And then we've got the intake. Uh, it came with this intake silencer. Um, these do actually reduce the sound of the intake and they kind of work, they're, they're not actually filters, but they prevent large particles from being sucked into the intake. So I think it's good to use these. And uh, this is one of the cheapest ones I've ever seen. It's super lightweight, but um, it's still probably better than nothing. And that just, that just goes right on the intake there. And then we've got some vent tubing and a T. This will expand, of course, and uh, this stuff works fine. The T will shrink though. So the first few times you run the heater, uh, the T will off gas. It smells like hot plastic and then it'll shrink and warp. So if you have it clamped down on this, you'll have to reclamp it. Um, yeah, it's, that's just how it is with these really cheap heaters. Um, they're probably not using an appropriate plastic for this. And then we've got the wiring harness. Um, the power and ground wires are too skinny to accommodate the, the proper amount of current. And this will cause issues depending on your power source. So plan on upgrading the wires on the wiring harness. And then they sent me the infamous green fuel line. A lot of people say that this stuff is great. It's easy to work with. It just, uh, slides right on to the end of the fuel pump and you don't need to use a clamp or anything. And uh, they say it works great. Although I have heard that people have issues with this stuff and my preferred method is to use the nylon line and then you use the black fuel line at the fittings. And then we got the exhaust. I'm actually happy with the exhaust pipe. Uh, the problem I had with my eBay unit is that the inner diameter of the exhaust was too large. So even if you put like a, a hose clamp on there really tight, the exhaust would just slip off and it would cause an exhaust leak. But this exhaust is actually sized appropriately. So that's uh, definitely something you wanna keep in mind. Um, having an exhaust leak right here is not good. And uh, yeah, it's just one of the reasons why this intake and this exhaust fitting, in my opinion, should never be inside your living space with you. That's why you use the mounting plate. And that's why all this stuff is outside because this exhaust is not airtight. And then I've got a little muffler that goes on the end of the exhaust. Um, a lot of people say that these mufflers don't do anything, but um, I disagree. The ones that you can see all the way through and have a little spring in the middle, those work really well. They kind of make the heater sound less raspy, but they're also not sealed very well. They've got a drain hole on the bottom for condensation. Yeah, it's just something to keep in mind that this is not an airtight thing. And then we got a bag full of like the, the cheapest hose clamps and zip ties in existence. There's also some self-tapping screws in here. And then we've got this fuel filter. I would never use this. Uh, you can go to an auto parts store and get like a, a cheap fuel filter for like a, a lawnmower or something. That'll work way better than this. This comes apart so you can like clean it out. And of years of using a diesel heater, I've never had to clean out this filter. I'm actually not using a filter right now because uh, the fuel that I'm tapping off of is filtered. We've got the mounting, rubber mounting thing for the fuel pump. I wouldn't use this because I have a way of mounting these that makes them a lot quieter. And uh, yeah, this, this can be used to mount the fuel pump. Um, I would also replace this fuel pump because it's really loud, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And then we've got this vent end here. Um, this just allows you to direct the hot air and this comes apart. So you can, uh, so you can mount this part to your cabinet or whatever, and then this clicks on and it rotates and it allows you to uh, direct the airflow. So I was setting this up and I was looking at this controller and I realized I've never seen this before. And when you try to go into the settings, nothing happens. Uh, I have figured out through the manual how to enter plateau mode, which I think is tuned for a little bit higher of an elevation, uh, which is good, but you, you can't manually adjust the settings at all. And then if you run your finger across the screen, it's just like, what is this crap? Like this is the cheapest crap I've ever seen in my entire life. So I'm done. I'm not gonna even bother running this. <laughs> 
So the company Wipro sent me this heater and the funniest thing is like, I think they forgot to send me a branded unit cause there's, there's no branding on it. And like, isn't that the whole point? Um, so anyways, I'm doing a review for free for these guys and uh, nothing's holding this tank in except for like the, the fuel line, which is kind of crazy. And we've got the infamous green fuel line over here. And uh, yeah, the fuel line going into the inlet at the bottom is kinked. So I think as they send it to me, it, it won't work. I'm pretty sure it won't work. And so, yeah, I'm not gonna review this anymore. It's, the quality is really low. The QC is non-existent. These all-in-one units are interesting. The problem is the controllers aren't waterproof. And I don't think there's ever a situation where you want the all-in-one unit to be inside of your living space because you have those exhaust connections inside your living space then, and that's dangerous. So I can see where you might wanna use these for like heating a tent or something, but then if it rains, your, your heater is gonna get ruined. So I don't really understand the point of these, but uh, they've become increasingly popular over the past few years. Okay, so credit where it's due. I think this gasket might, uh, I think this might actually be silicone. So, uh, good job. All right, we're getting ready to bench test this thing, which means it's time to dial in the settings. Okay, so there's a lot of different controllers out there, but this is the most common. So I'm just gonna show you how to change the settings on this one really quickly, um, just knowing that your controller might not be the same. So we press the settings button a couple of times and it brings us to this menu where we get to enter a secret code. And the secret code is one, six, eight, eight. And that's like the same for, for all of the, the diesel heaters. And then uh, the first setting we get to change is the pump rate. So that's in Hertz or times per second. And this is for low. So I'm gonna put that down to 1.2. And now we have high. I'm gonna bring that down all the way to 3.3. And then we have our fan speed at low, which I'm going to bring up to 2000. And then our fan speed on high, I'm going to bring up to 5000. And we hit okay. We're at 12 volts still. And I don't even know what these other options are. And that's it, we've tuned our heater. So you're probably wondering where the heck those numbers came from and why I am going way off of the factory default settings. And the thing is, I'm at 6,000 feet right now. So if I were to turn on the heater without changing those settings, it would start sooting up immediately. And sooting happens when you put too much fuel into the burn chamber and not enough air. So it's a rich burn mixture and we want to go lean. From what I understand, these heaters are perfectly happy running lean. Uh, even like Wobasto had an, a high altitude kit that they sold and all it did is it slowed down the fuel pump so that there was less fuel going in and therefore proportionally more air. So to get these numbers, what I did is I took the stock settings, I assumed that those were really good for running the heater at sea level, and then I looked up the density of air at a bunch of different elevations, and I assumed that the density of air would be roughly proportional to the amount of air that goes into the burn chamber at those elevations, and I made this chart. And uh, you'll see a lot of different versions of this chart. The numbers will be slightly different. I'm not saying that mine is the best. It's probably not, but uh, I, I did put some thought into this. So use these settings. Let me know how they work for you. I'm curious. I've been running my heater tuned for 15,000 feet, which is really extreme, especially for most people. You're not gonna get close to 15,000 feet. But I did recently camp at like 12,000 feet and the heater ran great at that elevation. I was also in Alaska this summer and I was at sea level and the heater also ran great. People say that if you go too lean, you will cause what's called a flame out. And that's where basically the flame is blown out of the burn chamber and then it you have burning in your heat exchanger and stuff. And uh, I don't know, I personally, I haven't had any issues with that. I think you'd have to really screw up your settings for that to happen. So you can go very lean safely in my experience. 
but you really want to avoid the rich condition to avoid the sooting. So that's kind of my standpoint. The only disadvantage of tuning it down for elevation is that you reduce the maximum heat output. So if you're heating a very large space, that could be an issue. But this heater is overpowered for my space as it is, so I, I don't really worry about that. And uh, yeah, that's, that's why you do that. I also made this chart for two kilowatt heaters. I don't own a two kilowatt heater, so I can't experiment with them as much. These numbers might be good, they might be bad, but I think it's better to tune them down than not do anything. And then yeah, there's a bunch of different digital controllers. You should always get those versus the dial controllers. And as we saw earlier, some of the digital controllers don't allow you to make these adjustments. Some of them have altimeters built in, which is pretty cool. That means that in theory, you should be able to not have to worry about this all. You can just turn on your heater and it will automatically adjust. The one thing I will say though is that every setup is different. So we have to keep in mind that these heaters don't have airflow sensors. They don't have valves and pistons. It's really just a dumb setup and like if you get a kink in your air intake, that can significantly reduce your airflow. Or if there's a bunch of mud that builds up on the air intake or, or something else is restricting the fan flow, like the bearings go bad, and you don't have this adjustability, then you can't fix it. And while we're looking at the controller, there's one other feature that I feel like is worth mentioning. So right now, when we press up and down, we're adjusting this value in hertz, which is the pump speed. So that's the number of pulses of fuel per second you're doing, and that correlates to temperature. But if you press the settings and the up button at the same time, now we're adjusting the temperature, which is cool. Um, the problem with this temperature mode is it runs the heater on its highest, hottest setting until you reach that temperature, and then it switches to the lowest setting until you dip below. So the heater is constantly ramping up and down between maximum and minimum. There's no hysteresis. It's not trying to find like a good setting to maintain that temperature. So if you're running this mode, your heater is going to be revving up and revving down all the time, and it's really not great for sleeping. So that's why I, generally run my heater in Hertz mode. Um, my living space is small, so I turn my heater all the way down typically. I just programmed in um, 1.2 Hertz as the minimum, and it's allowing me to go down to one. So I've been messing around with this a little bit, and yeah, no matter how I define the settings, it allows me to go down to one Hertz. And that makes me think this controller is enforcing a minimum fan speed. So the, the low setting that you put in isn't the lowest that's allowed, which is weird. So what this means is that I can't use the, the temperature mode safely because because I think one hertz is too low. I wouldn't go below 1.2 with these heaters. All right, we're ready to bench test this thing. I would recommend everyone do this. Just set it up outside of your living space or where you want to install it and make sure it runs fine on its own. I'm just running this off of a, a 30 amp LED power supply. I think this was like 30 bucks and it's been well worth it. I test everything that goes into my van. So I ran my fridge off of this for a month. But anyways, while we have this all set up, let's talk about common issues that people have with their setup. One thing is you wanna make sure that your minimum fuel level isn't too low. This is in relation to the fuel pump. So you want there to be no more than a meter between the fuel pump and the minimum fuel level. Likewise, the maximum fuel level should be no more than a meter above the pump. The fuel filter goes before the fuel pump, and then you wanna put the fuel pump as close to the heater as you can within reason. Uh, within a meter is a good rule of thumb. I wouldn't go much shorter than this because you'll get a lot of noise transmission from the pump into the body of the heater. And then when we're looking at your power source, the diesel heater draws about 10 amps on startup. So you wanna make sure that you have at least 15 amps coming from your power source. So make sure that your battery or whatever you're using is capable of that. And then your fuel pump should be mounted at an angle. It shouldn't be mounted flat like this. You want it to be between 15 and 30 degrees ideally. The outlet is on the plug side and the outlet should point up. And that's just to prevent bubbles from building up in here. There's like cavitation bubbles that build up, I guess. I, I don't really understand that, but that's what everyone says. And then I would highly recommend upgrading this wiring. Um, basically, this wire is really thin and so right at the harness here, I would cut it and splice in either a 10 or a 12 gauge wire. And especially if you're using a lead acid battery, the lead acid battery is going to sag a lot and then you'll have voltage sag across this thin wire. And what that can mean is that your glow plug won't get hot enough and your heater will fail to start if you don't upgrade this wire. So I would just recommend everyone do that. And of course, check all your connections, especially if you're running it through a fuse block, you wanna make sure every connection is clean and secure. And then, uh, yeah, 
The, the rule of thumb I've heard is that you get 270 degrees maximum bend angle on the inlet. So that's like three 90 degree bends are safe, but any more than that, and you're going to be restricting your inlet too much. And you don't wanna make this super long. There's no reason to make it longer than the stock. And similar with the exhaust, you don't wanna to do too many bends, no more than 270 degrees. And you don't wanna make it super long either because that will restrict the airflow into your heater and will mess up your air to fuel ratio. And so if you have a longer exhaust, I think you could probably just boost the fan speed a little bit and be safe. Another thing you don't wanna do with the exhaust is have a low point like I have here. So I intentionally set this up incorrectly. Apparently water will pool here and it'll corrode the exhaust so you want there to be no low points in the exhaust and you can look at the the muffler and there's a weep hole at the bottom so this is designed to be mounted vertical like this so that water will weep out the bottom and you won't get as much corrosion on the inside and then yeah the, the heater can be mounted on its side you just need to make sure the fuel intake is on the high side okay so without further ado let's get this started what we're going to do is we're going to press the okay and the down button and this will turn on priming mode. So this has just been taking forever to prime. And one of the issues is that this green fuel line just has a much larger inner diameter than the, the nylon line. I'm not going to bore you with all the reasons that this nylon line is the correct one to use. This is so much better in so many ways. And what you do is you make fittings with a uh, regular fuel hose. So you use the fuel hose to like adapt it to the fuel filter. All right, so the, the fuel line is primed and we're gonna start it up. I'm gonna use the remote. The remote should come synced from the factory. And there we go. Now you might notice that this fuel pump is pretty loud. I have a whole other video on how to quiet this thing down. So I'll, I'll link that if you wanna check that out. And first time you start up your heater, it'll probably be a little smoky. Um, if your settings are right, once you run it for a while, it won't be quite so smoky when you start it up. And voila, we have heat. So you might be wondering why I prefer this remote on the right. And there's actually a lot of reasons for that. One is that you can put it in your pocket, you can put it on your keychain, and you don't accidentally press a button. Also, in my experience, this thing has much better range than this. And the one on the left is cool because it's supposedly two-way communication, but you spend a lot of time looking at this screen. And sure, eventually it'll tell you if the heater is on or not. Whereas this, you're just kind of flying blind, but you kind of get a sense of how much range you have. And then you press the on button like 15 times and there's no, no disadvantage to hitting the on button a bunch. So we're just gonna leave this thing on its highest setting till we're almost out of fuel. You don't wanna be running these dry on fuel all the time because again, it's bad for the fuel pump. But this is a great opportunity to preheat all of our venting and burn off some of this plastic smell. I can definitely tell that there's a plasticky smell coming from this thing. And yeah, it's, it's not great, but this will at least help burn it off. And then if you do the other modifications that I talked about, it, it should be more or less smell free. Okay, so now that we've got the heater bench tested, it's time to install it. So the basic idea with mounting these heaters is that you cut a hole in your van or your shack or whatever, and then you put this mounting plate over it, and that gives space for the exhaust and everything to go through. I just use this as a template and drilled those holes directly into my van. This mounting plate wouldn't have worked because uh, the way you're supposed to screw it down kind of didn't line up with these ridges. and. Uh, one reason why you might not want to do this is because there's often sound deadening material in cars. And so I had to remove that sound deadening material. And then paint is technically flammable. So the real danger is that the exhaust gets really hot. And so anything that's even close to the exhaust has potential to catch on fire. So for example, if this was finished with a wood floor like the rest of the back of my van, I wouldn't want to even use this. I would use what's called a turret plate. And so what you do then is you cut a big hole with a, a hole saw and then the turret plate slides in and protects the wood from the hot exhaust. Also, the other feature of these mounting plates is that there is a little spot here. Um, you can use this for the wires that go to your fuel pump if your fuel pump is outside or if your fuel pump and fuel tank are inside, then you can just run the fuel line 
through here and plug it into the inlet. So whether or not you're using one of these floppy mounting gaskets with your heater, um, it's a good idea to seal everything up with some high temperature uh, gasket maker or silicone RTV. You can actually use this as a replacement for one of these, that's what I've been doing. If you only use this, you might get a little bit more vibration or noise from the heater transmitted to the, the body of your van, but it's just kind of like a droning humming noise, which doesn't, doesn't bother me too much. And then yeah, with routing the exhaust, you just wanna make sure there aren't any low points where water can accumulate, like I said before. The weep hole for the muffler is at the bottom, and then the exhaust shouldn't be close to anything flammable because especially up here, the exhaust can get red hot. And then my fuel pump is just in this box. That's the, the silencer box that I explain in, in another video, but it's also worth mentioning that the, the pump shouldn't just be exposed to the elements. The electrical connector is not waterproof. So you need to at least protect that from spray somewhat. And then, yeah, I have the intake kind of tucked up in here. Here it is. Uh, you can see it's pretty muddy, but um, I just have it up out of the way. It's somewhat protected from road grime. I went down the Dempster Highway and everything got muddy, but even while I was doing that, the heater kept working. So another thing that people say is that if you have the heater running on high and there's a power outage, the heater will be ruined. So let's see what happens. You'll notice, yeah, we're getting some smoke coming out of what's the intake pipe, and that's why you don't want to have your intake routed to the inside, because if there is a power failure, that's, uh, yeah, that's carbon monoxide, that's soot. And so it's, it's obviously not good to do this to the heater. When you turn the heater off, it goes through a shutdown procedure where it cuts fuel, and then it blows out basically everything else that's burning. So this is a great way to soot up your heater just by pulling the plug on it. All right, so I've let this cool off for about a half hour. I will say, I do think I smelled some burning plastic when I unplugged this thing. So it might be worse to unplug these things while they're running than I thought, but uh, I guess we'll find out right now if this, uh, this turns on. The controller still works, fan is still spinning up, and I'm just gonna put the intake pipe back on here. So yeah, we'll, we'll see if this still works yeah the heater appears to be unharmed and it's putting out heat again so i guess we got lucky there one cool thing about these heaters is that they will run on 100 kerosene so if kerosene is cheaper than diesel where you live you can just run 100 caro a lot of people say that the the pump will wear out because kerosene doesn't have the same lubricating properties as diesel but there are some gasoline heaters that are coming out on the market now and those use the same pump. And so gasoline has like no lubricating properties compared to kerosene or diesel and those pumps work fine. So that's another myth that I wanna dispel. Also people say that you can run kerosene to clean out your heater. Um, again, you won't have to clean it out if you get your fuel mixture right. And kerosene does have less energy density than diesel. So it just naturally burns a little bit more lean. If your volume fuel mixture is unchanged, the fuel will burn more lean if you're running kerosene. So that could potentially clean out your heater if you're having issues, but you can soot up a heater using kerosene just as well as with diesel. So I don't think there's any, any validity to that. You don't need to do that. Similarly, people will recommend using DPF cleaner to clean these out. And again, just get your fuel mixture right from the start and you don't have to worry about that. This isn't an engine. So I think engine soot cleaners that are meant for diesel engines might not work very well with this. You'll notice online that you have the option to buy an eight kilowatt, a five kilowatt or a two kilowatt heater. Those are just the, the power outputs or the heat outputs of these heaters. Um, those are all a lie too. I've heard that these five kilowatt models are closer to four and the eight kilowatt models, if you order one, you'll get one of these, you'll get one of the fives. And uh, sometimes the eight kilowatts will be tuned differently. They'll have like a higher dose fuel pump. And that's just a, a recipe for a sooted up, a coked up heater. So don't buy the eight kilowatt models. Um, those are just a scam. And then the two kilowatt models should be smaller. So verify the dimensions of your heater if you order a two kilowatt model. A lot of five kilowatt models are being sold as two kilowatts and they're just tuned down, which is another recipe for 
issues. A lot of people in Europe and Great Britain run the two kilowatt models because it doesn't get that cold there. Um, here in the States, it gets pretty cold. And so I'm happy running the five kilowatt heater even in my van, which is also insulated. And it's true, it does get too warm and it is annoying that these don't turn off automatically. But I just crack a window and run my vent fan to try to moderate the temperature. It's not as good as having like central air with a real thermostat, but you get pretty close. If you do want the option to go really into the weeds, make these turn off automatically, really fine tune these, there's this thing called the afterburner controller. I don't run one of these because I don't need that level of control, but a lot of people love the afterburner and say it unlocks a lot of potential for these heaters. So that's something that is also worth mentioning. But as far as brands go, I don't think it matters. I would just buy the cheapest one you can on AliExpress or eBay. I would try to get one that has the controller with the tunable setting that's harder and harder to find but like the the plateau mode is just crap although if your setup is at or around sea level you might do fine without messing with the settings at all so that's something that's worth mentioning there is a brand Lavenir who claims to have higher quality components and it does seem like they ship higher quality stuff they at least send out the right fuel line and their controllers I think adjust automatically for elevation which is pretty cool but they're between three to six times the cost of one of these cheaper ones so I can't really say that that's worth it. Uh, yeah, Vever and the other brand I reviewed that where they forgot to put their name on the heater um, would not recommend at all. I actually think I remember now the Wipro is slightly better. It at least came with a tunable controller, but they both came with that fuel line. If you want to buy a heater that comes with the correct fuel line, you need to look for a couple of things in the listing. One is that it should come with a piece of black fuel hose that's about this long. It'll be thinner in diameter than the intake hose, and then you'll have the clear nylon line coiled up as well. Um, they're disguising the green line now. They're making a clear line that's this the crappy flexible stuff, but you'll notice that that doesn't come with the other black fuel line and the, the hose clamps and everything. So ju just be careful about that. It's getting harder and harder to buy the right thing, which is really sad. A, a few years ago, most of them came with the same controller and they all came with everything you needed, but now the quality has just taken such a nosedive that it's hard to get what you need, which is, which is too bad. I was hoping that I could recommend like a good brand for everyone to buy, and um, I could say that it's easy to set these up and it's easy to buy the right thing, but unfortunately it's really not. And I don't wanna say too much because they're just getting more and more advanced with their strategies on how to nickel and dime you and uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'd say most of the heaters that are sold today are barely functional out of the box, and you have to do some work to get them set up. But I do think it's still possible to get these set up properly. And when you do get these running right, it's awesome. Uh, once you take care of the smells and the tuning, uh, you just press a button and you have heat, and it, it's, it's awesome. I love it. It's really unlocked a lot of potential for my van. It's allowed me to camp so much more comfortably than if I didn't have one. And so I think these things are awesome. If you think I missed anything or if there's anything you'd like to add, please leave it in the comments below. And yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see y'all in the next one. All right, I just wanted to show one more thing that you're not supposed to do. Uh, my trunk gasket is about 30 years old and it lets a lot of dust back here. And then this dust gets sucked through and blown into my living space. So I installed this little pod filter. Uh, the, the risk in installing one of these is that when it gets dirty, it will restrict airflow to the body of the heater and then the heater will overheat. So I'm just gonna have to keep it clean, but I think it's worth the extra maintenance to keep my indoor air a little bit more breathable.